So we see that decision trees are very intuitive, but they also can be very unstable, especially in small samples. So let's see the predictions that trees give us on who survives among the Titanic's passengers. So if you don't know, the sinking of the Titanic was a big event. It happened in 1912. It was one of the largest British liners that was traversing the Atlantic Ocean. And many people died. But maybe you also remember this event from the movie where a first-class passenger falls in love with the third-class passenger. Interestingly enough, it's exactly the class divisions that was quite predictive of whether the person would survive. So, if we take data on the Titanic passengers and we organize the passengers by their age and passenger class and we also know whether they survived the crash or not, we can take different samples from that data. For example, we can take random 80% and organize it as a sample number one, random 80% as a sample two, and another random 80% as sample three. And then we train our decision trees, three decision trees on three different samples. In general, it would predict that surviving was higher for uh, class number one and almost impossible for passengers from class number three. But it, there was, was also a relationship with the age, so younger passengers were more likely to survive. But it is also true that the boundaries of the decision tree that we trained looks different from sample to sample. So, for example, if we put back Kate Winslet's character and um, Leonardo DiCaprio's character, you would see that, in general, the prediction whether one or another sur survives is stable across different decision trees. But it can be not so true for someone else. For example, located in this area, age about 40 and class number one, according to this decision tree, this person would survive, and according to this decision tree on this subsample, this person will die. Decision tree, in general, are low bias but high variance models. They change very drastically from sample to sample. And because of this, they can lead to a low prediction accuracy. Remember, bias variance trade-off. It could be that the decision tree brings too much variance, leading to a very poor prediction accuracy. So here comes the idea of bagging. We take a training data and then we randomly sample lots of different subsamples, for example, a thousand or five thousand, and then on each of these randomly drawn sub subsample we train a specific decision tree. Using the information from these B different decision trees, we average all the predictions for regression trees or take the majority vote for classification trees. For example, if out of thousand trees, 501 say that a person with characteristics X would not survive the crash of Titanic, then the prediction would be that the person will die. And vice versa, if more than 500 trees say that the person will survive, then the prediction would be survive. So, for example, here, if we return back to our just three decision trees, uh, the majority vote would be that this person would survive, this person would die, but this is no contest because there is no difference between the predictions across the three trees. But this person will die because in two out of three, the prediction is that this person will die. Boosting procedure can be used not only for decision trees. So, for example, here we apply logit regression or OLS or whatever model would you want to use. And then the forecast would be simply the averaging or a majority vote from different uh, models on different subsamples. By averaging over many low bias but high variance models, we reduce the overall variance. So we are able to get a more accurate model. Random forest is very much related to bagging. The idea is exactly the same, except for the decision trees are trained on a subsample of predictors at each split. And usually the subsample of predictors are as many as the square root of the number of predictors. So, for example, if the number of predictors is 100, then we would usually ask random forest to use just 10 predictors at each split. So this creates not only the randomness in the underlying data, but also the randomness on the predictors. Why is this helpful? So random forest is helpful exactly when there is one strong predictor which overshadows all other predictors. But all other predictors can be also useful. But simply because there is one strong predictor, we're never able to use the other predictors. 
Another thing is that by randomly removing some predictors at each split, we reduce the correlation between different trees across bootstrapped samples. Remember, we want to reduce variance of our models, and by reducing this way correlation between different models that we train across different samples, we are able to get a more accurate model. Boosting procedure is a bit different, but it also has the idea of training many trees. Boosting will grow decision trees sequentially. Each new decision tree will attack the residuals, the unexplained errors of the previous tree. And each tree is usually shallow, so it's not a complicated tree. But there are many of them, and each has a chance to improve over the previous model on its own, in its own turn. Hence, boosting is a slow learning procedure which accumulates the wisdom of many trees. In practice, suppose you have training data from observation 1 to observation n. You have your target variable and you have your set of predictors. So as a first step, you say, OK, my prediction is zero for all observations. So we take the residuals and the residual is just simply the target value itself. Then we train the first decision tree. We train the residuals on the predictors and we obtain new prediction. The new prediction is the old prediction plus some lambda, which is less than one multiplied by the prediction of this decision tree number one. So we can get the new residuals. So the new residuals would be the old residuals, y1, for example, for the first observation, minus the prediction, minus lambda y1 x1. So basically the prediction for the first observation by the first decision tree shrunk by parameter lambda. Now we again train the decision tree now it's a decision tree number two, which tries to attack the residuals by predicting the residuals from the set of predictors. In this way, we can get the new predictions, which is the old prediction, this one, plus the shrunk prediction from the second decision tree, and so on. We can grow many decision trees, not just two. In general, the algorithm looks like this. Set predictions to zero and residuals to y. Then for trees number one to b, repeat the following steps, so where you train the decision tree to predict the residuals on the predictors, update predictions according to this formula, update residuals, and continue again and again with new residuals, with new predictions. In the end, the output of the boosted model is the prediction y conditional on x, where it sums up all of the predictions from all different trees. There are, in general, three free parameters in the boosting algorithm. The number of trees. Here, you should be careful. Choosing too high B may lead to overfitting. Boosting too many trees may result in overfitting. We need to cross-validate this parameter. There is the shrinkage parameter lambda, which is usually set between 0.1% uh, to 1%. It controls the speed of learning, and smaller lambda requires usually higher B. So you can play with your boosting model by putting higher B and very low lambda or putting higher learning parameter and lower number of trees. And finally, the number of splits D which uh, are allowed in each of the trees. Usually D equal one, meaning that allowing only one split works very well. Why? Because you can think of it as all these trees as being little ants each is small and powerless, but their combined strength is in numbers and they jointly attack on one goal.